Welcome to this week's Swarf and Chips. We have a takeover show with HK. This is what's coming up on today's show and it's a brilliant show all about 3D printing and maybe not your traditional materials. However, Mark and Paul and I are joined by Steve Wilcox, who is the Managing Director of HK. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, can you give us a bit of an insight to HK? Because it's a bit of an umbrella company, isn't it? You cover quite a few sectors. We, we do, yeah. There's, there's three different areas of HK. We've got HK Lasers, um, we traditionally offer a, a service uh, of part marking. We have HK Technologies, and there's multiple brands that we look after. Uh, the main one there is Mitsubishi, uh, EDM Equipment. And of course we have HK3D, which we're here to, to focus on today. And this is the printer size that we're talking about today, but you do also do bigger 3D printers, don't you? That make parts <laughs> like these, which I thought, oh, was, yes. I thought was very apt for today's oh, show. Oh, thank you. you Shall go. I have it Indeed. sitting next to me? Oh, it's got some weight behind it. Soon, soon, very soon. <laughs> I know we're going to talk about the machines of that know. size, <laughs> but you do go to that extent don't you yeah we have yeah i mean in, in rugby we've got uh, the whole the whole range on on show to be honest with you going from the uh, the the entry at level machines at this sort of size going all the way through to the to the big machines that can produce <laughs> baby seats as well feels so. very natural actually <laughs> to be there i know we're going to be covering obviously a demonstration and everything but can you give us a little bit of an overview like where are you based in the uk how many people are with you and just a little insight yeah of course so the, the, um, we're based in rugby um mm -hmm. we've been in rugby now for for just over 60 years, um, and there's 25 people in our team. Um, so we're, we're made up really of a, of a core group of, of engineers, people that have come from industry, have been involved at different facets of engineering at their stage. And so we've got sales guys, application guys, service guys, offering uh, multiple different products in the UK. So, yeah. And we're going to be talking about Mark Forge. How long have you known and had the relationship with Mark Forge? Yeah, so we've known Mark Forge for some time now. Uh, we've been doing some, some work behind the scenes, let's say, for, for a considerable amount of months, testing the products. Uh, and the turn of the year, we sort of signed up and agreed to, to move forward with Mark Forge. So, uh, so from, from January this year, uh, technically we've been a, a production partner for Mark Forge. And the beauty of these type of machines, you can cater for any sector, can't you? You can. I mean, you, you know, we, we're still striving to find that 3D printer that, that fits, fits everything. But we know in reality we're never going to find that. But what Mark Forge do is something very, very different. They bring something unique into the, to the marketplace. And we saw it. Uh, what we needed to know is that the machines were going to be reliable. Um, and they are. So the good news is we've, uh, we've managed to find and fill a sector which we believe really does bring 3D printing, additive manufacturing, to the engineer's desk. When, when you talk about reliability, what do you base that on? What, why is this machine so different, all this range of machines? Yeah, I mean, so far, seven, just over 70% of our sales have been related to manufacturing. Now, we know, providing EDM equipment, our machines have to be reliable. People, are, people are, whether they're, they're, they're cutting metal or whether they're, they're printing a plastic part, they need to know that if it's involved in the manufacturing process, they can rely on it. And that's where we come from. Um, the 3D printing mindset of, you know, as it worked, let's try it again if it hasn't, kind of has to go away. And, uh, and really, Mark Forge have taken that pattern and said, no, we're, we're going to deliver this into an environment where the engineers are going to know, come what the morning when they go in and we want to see the parts, they're mm. going to be right. Yeah. So, I mean, because for those that maybe don't know this, Mark, or haven't bought these sorts of machines, are we then saying that there, is, uh, there are some machines out there that maybe aren't that reliable? Is that, is that a common trend in this sort of market? Yeah. It, well, um, the machines have improved massively on all levels, yeah. so let's be honest, I'm not going to sit here and start knocking at other, other technologies, but traditionally speaking, the sub £10,000 mark, people knew what they were getting, it was an acceptable level of, it's a look-see part, something that, whether, you know, it's a verification to see whether my design looks right, and I chuck it away. When you're coming from a perspective where we need a part that's actually going to perform, it's going to be involved in um, a, a drill jig, or whether or not it's an end product, we, we know that it needs to be right, so that, that's, um, that's kind of where the worlds have met really and I think Mark Forged have, have seen that opportunity and, uh, and they've delivered it in this box. But what have, what have they done to this particular box, call it, to, to make it reliable? What are some of the, 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 the features maybe? The, 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 the owner of Mark Forged over in the States has got a mindset of, uh, of quality. You know, the, uh, the, the machine is, is built with an aluminium based machine, it's solid. I mean, we, 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 it's sitting here running right now and we're talking. I'm not having mm. to raise my voice too loud. Uh, mm. it, it's, you know, 
So I, I don't know. I think the ethos within the business, the manufacturing that's done over there in Boston, everything is geared around a, a, a part that's going to be accurate, that's going to be repeatable, and a machine that's reliable. So, Steve, is, is this typical size that Mark Forge actually manufacture? Yeah, I, I, think, I think if you look at the, the majority of components that we, we, we produce for people or people are producing, fit within the shoebox size. So um, I think it's a, it's a good start point. Of course, they do do bigger machines as well. We tend to find they, they come into play where people are looking at uh, multiple parts, so for volume yeah. production, really. So my question is, a lot of, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but what, what are the normal materials? Because there's traditional materials, but you're kind of expanding in your material range now, Yeah, aren't you? totally. I mean, in, in, um, in Boston, where all these materials are designed and developed, um, it, it, it's kind of, that, that's part of the, the unique selling point, let's say. You know, we, they've managed to actually design a material. It's called Onyx material. So the, the, the principle of that material is it's basically a nylon, uh, but it's got carbon chips inside it, so it gives it ultimate strength. Uh, it doesn't just stop there. We lay down that material, but we also get option to be able to put Kevlar in there, carbon fibre, a high temperature material as well that we can actually lay down within the component. Um, all driven by the software. Um, you know, the software is a real key But point. the aim of that is making a, a, a far more durable and tougher component? It, it is, and, 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 and you know, just because we can put carbon fibre in there doesn't mean it's right for your part. You might need a bit more flex flexibility in the component, um, but absolutely right. You know, you, you, you put the right filament material inside that on X material, as we call it, yeah. to suit the application that you want to use it for. Is that where you say on your website, fibre reinforce? Fibre reinforce. Yeah, yeah. Okay. absolutely, yeah, absolutely. When, when we first got the machine, the, you know, the, the natural thing was to put as much uh, carbon fibre in there as you could to see how, how strong the parts would be. But the truth is, you don't need to do that. Right. You just need to be clever within the software and put the, 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 the carbon where you actually want it to be. So. Would you, would you uh, talking about the software, it's a massive part of buying mm. any machine, whether it be 3D printing or other. What, tell us the story behind that, how good is the software? It's the guy, it's, it's the, yeah, it, it, just as I would go on about the materials or the build a machine, it's so important. The mm. software, um, the, the engineers, when you go over to Boston, you see them all sitting there, you know, they're all typing away, developing the material. It actually runs on a, a Chrome network, so uh, the software, you, you dial in, you get an option to be able to, to work uh, as a collaborative approach, so you can look at other people's files, you can share them, mm. but uh, the truth is, it's simple, we can do green button printing as we would say, bring a, a CAD file in, press print and it'll, it'll automatically put carbon in there, mm. and then we can spend an awful lot of time in that software as well and really dig deep and actually change all the different complexities, whether or not it's the internal structures, whether it's whereabouts the, the carbon laid. For example, you might not want carbon where you're going to drill and tap a hole, okay? but you might want it on a certain area where you need that rigidity. Yeah. So you can choose wherever you might want that additional filament to be. It's a different way of looking at engineering, isn't it? It's a different way of mm. looking at manufacturing. Rather totally. than taking apart and, and subtracting and machining it, you can make it in whichever way is best. Uh, and when, when you look at these products, for, for our audience, what's the typical application that you, this is aimed at? Yeah, I mean, so versatile, isn't it? I mean, we, 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 we're shocked every time we have an open event or someone rings up for a demonstration or whatever it might be, and we say, what are you looking at doing? And yeah. it really is an open, open door policy. You know, we can go from a car manufacturer that's looking at producing M parts that might want it leather wrapped, going through to a, uh, as a two-man band with, that do CNC machine tool, and they also want to offer a service to be able to do parts in plastic mm. for their customers. The, the applications themselves, I would say, stem, or, or, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, that a lot of it's manufacturing related. So yeah. whether or not we're looking at mold tools, jigs fixtures, um, and, and I mean CMM fixtures, I mean drill guides, um, going through to, to people that actually have found a way to produce the components on here the best possible way. That might be that the, the volumes aren't massive. It might be that the criteria is weight reduction. Whatever it might be, they're finding a solution in, it, we, we, through this process. It's quite interesting on your website because you've written, you know, industries, aerospace and defence, arts and entertainment, automotive, architecture, <laughs> moulds, education, concept modelling. I, I mean, it's, it's huge. You missed out dental. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it is. It's like that. You know, yeah. and, uh, you, you, OK, look, there's, there's, there's always a challenge that's pretty common. You know, someone, someone ultimately... Um, wants to find a solution to the challenge they've got. You know, whether it's come from a, a dentistry, mm. it's how they're currently manufacturing. You know, whether or not it's aerospace, it's how they're currently manufacturing. Mm. And we can, we can look at it. I, we never sit there and say this is a one-stop solution. Yeah. Um, yeah. What we do have, as we mentioned earlier on, in, in terms of what HK offering, we have got a, a wider portfolio. Um, but, you know, 
additive manufacturing isn't for everybody. You know, we, we are very much a business that's, that's got um, uh, traditional manufacturing techniques at the heart of it. Um, so we don't dismiss that. You know, we embrace this and, and bring the, the worlds together. And it's in operation at the moment, so it's quiet, yeah. it's practical, yeah. isn't it? All of those yeah. sort of hallmarks. I think it's time for a demo. <laughs> yeah. Or can you just explain, before we go over to Technology Corner, can you explain just what's going on here? Well, I can do, yeah, of course. I mean, first of all, uh, we've got a material feed coming through the, the back of the machine. This is the, the Onyx material. So this is our core uh, centred material, if you like. And going actually on with inside the unit, um, that material gets fed around and it's then laid down layer by layer. It, in all fairness, it's the most simplest, straightforward process of printing that material on it on the build tray. The build tray uh, works its way down as the part builds yeah. itself up. If that was it, we'd be sitting here and saying, OK, so what's the benefits? Well, I'd say that the surface finish is excellent on this machine. I'd say the build quality, the repeatability is there. But the big addition to this technology is this little reel that you can see down here on the left-hand side, which is the um, filament material. That's where our carbon fibre comes from. That's where our Kevlar comes from or yeah. our, our high, high temperature material. The reinforced part of The reinforced elements. Okay. So that gets fed through a different nozzle and it's then laid down at the same time simultaneously with the other material. So in effect it's sandwiched inside the, the onyx material as we say. Mm. The net result is we get a part that you know is, it's got its rigidity. It's really, really strong because of the carbon filament that's through it. Brilliant, thank you. Right, well I think simple it's... Simple as that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you make it sound very simple. This, this piece, this on the back, this is obviously where the material's coming from. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, we're gonna, we've still got some more questions to ask you, but I think, Paul, you're going to head over and meet Ross on Technology Corner. Technical Corner. So today's Technical Corner, I'm joined by Ross Varney. Ross, tell us about the Metal X to start. Sure. So the Metal X is uh, Mark Forge's latest machine. Um, it's due with us at the end of this year, around October time. And essentially what it does is it opens up um, metal additive manufacturing um, to... A, uh, a different kind of area uh, and a different maybe uh, user. Um, so what it does is it uses fused filament technology. So it's laying down metal uh, in the same way that the plastic machines are working essentially. Um, it then uses a similar process to metal injection molding technology where you take the part, so a green part, we debind it so we take away some of the plastic that's holding that part together um, and then we sinter it. And so we, we, we kind of fuse that part together um, and so we have our finished part. So how different is this product to others out there in the market? Because printing metal is something in recent years lots of people are talking about and there's lots of availability of machines. I want to try and find out today why this particular product is a little bit different, in yeah, your opinion. Sure, yeah, yeah. So it's quite unique. Um, as you mentioned, there are metal machines, metal printing machines already available. Um, obviously, laser sintering is a widely used technology where um, powder is essentially coated across the base. Um, a laser is then used to sinter the, the metal powder. Um, but these machines are both expensive, um, but also they take a lot of infrastructure to, to, to house them. So the metal powders themselves are quite, um, quite harmful. So it needs to be protective clothing worn when you're using them. Processes can be quite long in terms of changing materials, those types of things. Um, so this process essentially encases that metal powder uh, into a plastic binder uh, and feeds that into the machine in, in a rod system. Um, and so anybody familiar with a kind of fused um, pr plastic process will be familiar with this kind of process. It's essentially layering those, uh, those, those layers down on the, on the base plate uh, through a print head, um, which is then giving us our, our, our unfinished green state part. So what sort of materials are we talking about here, Ross, that can be used on this machine? So, uh, so the, yeah, the materials that are going to be available are um, aluminiums, uh, tool steels, stainless steel, um, inconel, titanium uh, on the machine. Um, and really uh, there are a whole range of materials in, in beta as well at the moment in Mark Forge. So essentially any material that currently is used in, 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 in MIM, metal injection moulding technology, could potentially be used in this process. Um, it's just a case of, um, of, of, of getting those materials uh, ready for, for use. And I always think in this instance engineers are looking at reasons not to buy these machines rather than to buy them. Mm -hmm. And that being the case, they often raise these objections, mm. um, one of which might be uh, things, for example, like the accuracy of a finished part. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's crucial to know that your part is going to be within certain tolerances. Um, and so the parts that we're, that we're, we're getting out of the, the Metal X 
um, will be near net shape. So um, essentially what you will do when you get that part out of the sintering oven um, is maybe do some fine finishing, so um, on mounting points or surfaces, crucial surfaces, um, uh, to, to within your tolerances. Um, but the parts themselves um, will be uh, within 100 micron, 200 micron range uh, of tolerance from, okay, from so the Okay, so in answer to that objection, these machines are capable of making parts to pretty reasonably uh, tight tolerances. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole, the whole point of the machine really is that it's, it's capable of producing end-use parts. Now, I know you've touched on this a little bit already about the differences between your machine and the powders, but another objection raised might be things like the strength of the component once mm. it's printed. What would you say to that? So yeah, so the, the, the process essentially creates a, um, a solid, fully dense part. Um, so 98% dense or above is considered fully solid. Um, and the sintering technology essentially fuses the, the, the metal crystals together um, to the equivalent strength of, of, of billet material, so a machined uh, billet. So that would be my next question, really. If you had, if you were making that part out of a out of a billet, mm. or you were printing it, mm. do you think you could you could you could offer a similar strength in, in final component? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and with the added benefit then that um, you know we can we can build in and design in uh, intricate internal structures that we couldn't do otherwise in a, in a more traditional manufacturing process. So um, really depends on the on what you want from the part. But if that was something that you you know you essentially couldn't do with any other technology, um, then then absolutely yeah, that would be uh, something that you could print and have the same strength. And some some points you we've already spoken about, but the th kind of the three phases. I was also also interested in the cooling process once the, the part's been printed. But you've got three phases: print, debinding, and sintering, haven't you? Yeah. But we're talking about a machine here that's, that's just doing the printing. So yeah, the machine, the Metal X machine itself, um, similar form factor to the uh, form structure to the, to the other machines. So it will be familiar to anyone that has a machine or has seen one of the Mark uh, Forge machines. That essentially produces our green state part. So that will be 20% bigger than the final part will be. So the, the software factors your part up prior to printing it. Um, you take your part out of the machine itself. So that's produced the form for you. We then debind it, so we put it into a, a wash, which debinds uh, part of the plastic um, encasing material. And then finally, the part is sintered in a, in a sintering oven um, and fully fully finished. So it will reduce in size by about 20%. So take that 20% compensation out to give you... Exactly, to, to, the, to, yeah, to, the, to the size of the CAD model that you put in to begin with. And when we talk about printing, what about the layers? What's the depth of the layers or the amount of the, the, the metal that's printed yeah, per layer? Sure. So when we talk about layers and we're thinking about 3D printing or additive manufacturing, you know, any, any part that's produced is essentially sliced into layers. That's how the process works. And those layers are then built up um, through the Z-axis as the, as the printer in different technologies. And this is the um, same plastics, metals, whatever. Plastics, metals, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, so the, the layer resolution on the Metal X is 50 microns. Um, which is which is which is very good. Um, you can see the quality of the part off there, and obviously, um, yeah, you can, like I say, finish those parts with with you know minimal machining at the end of it. So on the Metal X machine, we talk about costs. We talk about costs per part in every type of engineering mm -hmm. and manufacturing. But the overall cost of the machine has often been a barrier to entry in people buying three D printers for metals mm. over recent years. How much is this Metal X machine? So the Metal X machine um, with the, the peripherals um, will, will run about 105k. Um, which and how, is... mu how much less is that when you know this market, which you do, mm -hmm. compared to a lot of um, other companies that are offering additive manufacturing machines? Yeah, so significantly, significantly less than, say, a, a laser sintering machine. Um, and you have to factor in as well any uh, infrastructure changes that you may need to make to actually house and install the machine in terms of powder. Um, so, so it's it's we think of it in terms of build volume. So you kind of equate a cost to build volume. Uh, roughly, you would say a 300 by 300 mil cube is around the 600k, and, and you can kind of factor that down to about 200 for a 100 by 100. Um, so this is coming in underneath uh, a smaller build volume within the laser um, kind of manufacturing side. So potentially 50% less in, in initial investment than some of your competitors. Maybe. Yeah, more than that, really. Yeah. So it's so kind of, often often with those. Uh, significant differences in price, there comes a compromise. What is it? Uh, yeah, so uh, I would say the compromise, I guess, would be that your uh, the resolution, the layer height, isn't quite as fine as some of the laser sintering technologies. Um, so they can run to 16 microns, 
uh, you know, uh, very, very fine lines. And so if you're doing things in dental, for, for example, um, the laser technology is perfect for that and is a fantastic application for that. Um, this really opens up um, the possibility to produce strong, solid parts that you couldn't produce in any other way um, without having to invest in, in a, a huge infrastructure change within a, a manufacturing environment um, and enables anybody really to operate the machine and to produce those parts. So you don't have to be particularly specially trained or have you know, material handling uh, kind of issues. So when you take into account that you mentioned there that there are some things that maybe other bigger machines might be better than this for, mm -hmm. what, what's the market for it? What's the split? Would it suit 70% of applications in, in, in the uh, metallics or 80% or 20%? Where do you see it as, a, as where it sits in the market? I think, I think I would equate it to where the, the, the plastic and the carbon fibre reinforced machine has kind of come in and really started changing people's uh, minds and opinions and, and, and kind of adoption of, of these types of technologies, um, really in opening up all sorts of new avenues, new applications, um, new ways of thinking about how to produce parts within a manufacturing environment. So I would, I would say really that it's, um, it will really kind of start to take off, people will start to see applications for it. Like I say, it's near net shape um, parts that it will produce. Um, and so, you know, anything that, that, that you would like to reduce the weight of, it's fantastic. Powder machines will not be able to produce that part. Um, the powder machine would typically encase the powder within it, so you wouldn't save any weight by, by producing any structure within there. Whereas um, the Metal X will essentially allow you to, you know, create any kind of structures, any kind of cooling structures, um, and, and remove that in the sintering process. So really allowing you to start designing products um, to, to take advantage of, of additive manufacturing. So let, let's, I know there's probably four or five points to summarize on the metal side before we maybe move on to some of the, mm. the other parts. If you had to summarize the Metal X machine in, in four or five points, what would they be? Yeah, there would be um, accessibility. So um, being able to essentially set up a metal additive, additive manufacturing machine. Um, anywhere and everywhere. Pretty much anywhere and everywhere, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say cost is a huge benefit, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a real great you entry can, point. You can cost. almost experiment at 105,000, can't you? It sounds, yeah, I know exactly. it's still a lot of money, but it's, it's a lot less than 200, 300, 400, or half a million pounds. Definitely, definitely, yeah. Um, you know, and, and in terms of kind of operational costs, those kind of things, time, you know, is a huge cost. Um, so, so changing material perhaps might take, you know, two days, three days more on a powder machine, um, whereas changing materials for, for the Metal X will take a matter of hours because it's bottled. So we could go based. from a stainless to a titanium to an Inconel in a matter of hours rather than a matter Absolutely. of days. Absolutely, it uses the same um, principles as the plastic uh, technologies, and, and you know we're very very familiar. People are used to using that, and it's a very quick process. So yeah, I mean you're cutting down, you know, all of your kind of barriers, your time scales, your schedules. So you're you're essentially benefiting. The return on investment is is much bigger than just the machine costs or the material costs. So you've mentioned three there: accessibility cost and powder and change over mm. of materials. Give me a fourth. Ease of use, ease of operation, yeah. So, um, like I say, it's using really familiar technologies. Um, it's using the same software that the whole Mark Forge range uses. So if you've already got a machine, um, you can download that software anyway as a trial and, and see how it operates and how it works. So um, it's basically anybody can use it, anybody can produce metal parts. Um, you know, you don't need any particularly special training to be able to produce parts. And this is a question that's just come into my head. If there is a company out there that's got additive manufacturing machines and they're printing metal, and, and the machine maybe did cost them half a million pounds because that was all that was available, is there a likelihood that you're gonna be able to start penetrating those companies as well because you've got a lower cost vehicle or a lower cost uh, solution for them? Yeah, I would say anybody interested in, in metal additive manufacturing should be looking at this technology, you know, they should be considering it. Obviously, you know, applications, it's very dependent on the particular application that, that, that people want or that people are interested in. And that um, brings me on to you, because mm. one of the big things about HK that Steve's mentioned on the sofa already is the support, the structure, the individuals that it's not about s supply machines. Lots of companies can, can sell lots of machines, stack them high and, mm. and sell them. You don't do that, do you? And that's not your role. You're very technical, correct? Absolutely, yeah. So my role is applications. So it's, it's support, and that is, you know, that starts from way before somebody considers buying a machine or is starting to think about it, all the way through um, to installation and then beyond. You know, afterwards, as people are starting to use it and wanting to know how they can get more and more out of it. So yeah, we're very, very focused on applications, on our customers getting the most out of the machines and assisting them. So people will come with a specific question or a specific um, requirement, 
and we will then you know kind of take that as a starting point and, and start to learn more about their business and how else they can apply it because often when you bring these technologies into a business you know that really it will open up uh, your you know mindset of, of what's possible and where you can apply it it's very exciting this metal x because i'm, I'm going to be interested to talk to you again in six months or a year's time to see how many you've sold because i think pitch to the right place, the right audience, um, using the right vehicles to get it to the market, you'll sell a lot of machines. Good stuff, thank you very much for your time. I'll let you get back to the chairs, thanks Ross. Thanks. Thank you for joining us, Ross. Now, I think this is fascinating. 2014, you were talking about a carbon fiber machine. 2017, we're talking about a metal building machine, shall we say. Um, I know you've discussed all parts and all manner of materials and everything but with Paul, but is it is it unaffordable? Is it untouchable? What, what what's it all about? So yeah, so in regards to the to the metal machine that we've got coming mm -hmm. out at the end of this year, um, it's it's really uh, positioning itself in a, in a really affordable bracket for people that want to start using metal parts uh, in an engineering end use kind of scenario. So, um, and really what we kind of look at in terms of metal manufacturing, additive manufacturing, is the, is the build volume. So quite often the build volume is equ equated to, to a cost point. At the moment, you're looking at about kind of half a million, 600,000 for a, a 300 by 300 yeah. kind of cube space. So this machine is coming in um, at around about 100K just above. So you can see already that it's, it's offering mm. the ability to make parts uh, of that size for a, for a very affordable kind of price point. And you've just said about additive manufacturing, just to kind of clear the air with many people who are watching, is there a difference? What's the difference, additive manufacturing, 3D printing? I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say there is a difference, you know? I mean, typically, um, people used to use the word, uh, term additive manufacturing at a higher end machine, yeah. or mm. maybe it was related to a manufacturing process. Mm. But the truth of the matter is, is that the, we've seen already that you know, these machines that are even less than £10,000 mm. can be used in an additive manufacturing mm. environment. So to mm. me, it's one of the same thing. The, the, the portfolio <laughs> products that you've got, I, I see you guys as engineers coming to you and, and your solution providing in a way. In other words, you know, I need to make this product. How can I do it? Is this material or that material? Is that where you see yourselves? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so really that's where we kind of come into the equation. People come to us with, with uh, problems or an interest in additive manufacturing as a solution. Um, and so then we can assist them in terms of the technologies that are available, um, the most appropriate um, uh, approach to kind of tackle whatever application it is. So um, yeah, it's all about materials. Yeah. It's all about possibly speed, volume, different questions. So we really need to understand um, what the client's coming uh, with, what questions they have, then we can start working with them to, to find solutions for that. Yeah. And it doesn't finish there, I've got to say, because we, we, often, we often get to a certain point with a customer. As Ross said, we, we get to the point where they, they want the machine. Mm. But then when we go and do the visits afterwards and we go and learn actually where they then move from. Mm. Uh, we had a customer come to one of our events because they're looking at the next tier machine. And, and they stood up and gave us a, an overview about what they've been using the machine for. They yeah. shared photos with us, they've shared parts with us. And we inadvertently learn, don't we, Ross? Mm. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and it's one of the def defining factors of mm. this machine that people will come with a specific mm. uh, purpose for it and they'll yeah. buy the machine on that basis. What they'll then do is when they start yeah. using that machine in their environment, mm. they'll start looking around and they'll start mm. seeing other areas where they can yeah. apply the technology. So it starts to grow. Mm. They start to see much more value in the machine. So it will start from one point and then actually kind of expand outwards. Can I put you guys on the spot? How much is this? Well, so so we've got three machines in the in this group, yeah. um, and they start from just under five thousand pounds, and that's delivered, installed, trained, and you can even, if you're lucky, get this guy to come out <laughs> and install and do the training. Um, going through to the the machine that does all the materials, so that's yeah. the Cavalier and everything, and that's still um, <coughs> sub eleven thousand pounds. Wow. wow, it's good. Right, before we find out about any events and anything else, I, I've got a little bit of a tricky question to ask you. Sorry, Ross. No, but, right. you know, there will be people walking up, they'll be, you know, considering them, this machine, maybe have a few reservations. What are those kind of bridges that you have to overcome? Uh, you know, it could be cost of part. Is there an improved cost of part? You know, 3D printing as opposed to removing material. W what are those questions? And, you know, give, give us some answers. Sure. Okay. So, um, 
Yeah, so I mean the main questions I would say are people are interested in these machines, the whole range of Mark IV machines for their strength. So really one of the, the first questions is, is about strength of part. Mm -hmm. yes, they want to see you know, uh, the parts themselves kind of you know, get a feel for, for what that part uh, does and how they can apply it in their business. So, so strength and we can kind of show then uh, you know, in terms of the different materials and the way in which we can design parts as we've already spoken about. Um, that you can, you know, you can really engage these materials to yeah. create um, really strong parts. So that's one of them. Accuracy is, is really, really important mm -hmm. as well. So in any, any manufacturing mm -hmm. environment, engineers will always say, how accurate is it? Mm -hmm. Can I rely on it? You know, will it uh, you know, build to the tolerances that mm -hmm. we require? So again, that's a big question, um, you know, and we're able to, to absolutely kind of answer that. You know, these machines will build within a, a 100 micron tolerance, which, you know, for this technology yeah. is, mm -hmm. is fantastic, yeah. you know, and, and for, uh, for things like jigs, fixtures, those types mm -hmm. of things, it's, it's perfect. For the metal machine, um, it will build near net shape, you know, then machining to finer tolerances, which again is kind of similar to, to other processes. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, accuracy would be another question. So you've got accuracy, strength, and also price is often, you know, something that comes up. And like, as I said earlier, you know, is there a major difference in price of, say, this material adding or having a block of metal and removing? What, what, what do you come up against? Okay, I'll, I'll answer that one. I mean, the, the, the Mark IV's technology have come to market with that in mind, uh, because traditionally there could, used to be a gulf between those two, two yeah, points. Yeah, sure. It's cut closer, for sure, without a doubt. Um, I think probably, as you've already seen, the metal component that we, we spoke about, you know, mm. um, material cost to machine it, anywhere between three and a half, four pounds. Uh, to actually 3D print that on our metal machine, it's going to cost you just over nine pounds. Okay. Yeah. So it's not massively different, mm -hmm. but what do you've got to take into consideration if somebody said that they wanted mm. to reduce the weight of this part by 40%, mm. we can do that on the additive manufacturing. Yeah. So it's mm. where that value comes in and where that mm. meets, if you like. Mm. Mm. So just giving me a part and saying, is it cheaper? Mm. Probably the most in cases it's not going to be. Mm. But if you spend a little bit of time in design or you mm. actually think it through yeah. in terms of the value that you really want from the part, Mm. We, we, we can bring that closer mm. and even to the point where it's yeah. defined as cheaper because of its performance. Is it, yeah, it's an individual application, mm. isn't it, really? Uh, and what I like about this is that from an engineering point of view, they've made this look good. It's really finished well, isn't mm. it? It's not just about a, you know, a box doing something. It actually looks good on, on your desk, doesn't it? It's designed to be sat in an office as well. Yeah. You know? So if you're sitting there, you're designing your models, you, know, you, can, you can have that sat next to you. It's, it's not going to you know, detract from your office yeah. um, and, and it's going to produce end use parts. You know, that's really the kind of the, the vision that Greg Mark had was to produce you know, end mm. use strong parts. Um, and to integrate it in a way that you know you don't have to have huge facilities to, to be able to kind of contain these these machines, yeah. and that goes all the way through all the way up to the metal machine. So, yeah. Can we see you at any events this year? Um, we're at TCT. Uh, we're going to have uh, a, a decent sized booth there, showing a, a bit of a different process. Really, we're kind of looking at the, the perspective of of a, of, a, of a three stage flow from software, so people. No, how do we design for additive mm. manufacturing 3D printing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> going through to the materials and the part types mm. so people can get a flavour about whether it's metal, yeah, yeah. whether it's nylon, whether it's mm. uh, ABS materials. Mm. And then finally, in the final mm. sort of third of the, uh, of, of the stand, we'll have the machines, yeah. ultimately the output mm. devices, and this being one mm. of them. Uh, it's bigger brother, he's yeah. going to be there, and some of the machines from 3 systems as well. Yeah, and, and that's the key about exhibitions, isn't it? It's actually showing and demonstrating rather than just saying this is a box, this is what it does. Actually, seeing it actually working like we've had today. Oh, it's so good going to exhibitions. It really is. You, you actually get to see comparable technologies and everything. But I'm all for it. So, um, and one last thing: have you got a deal on at the moment or something? Yes, there is at the moment. I mean, it, it's run from Mark Forge. Basically, what they're saying is they they want people uh, that may want the metal machines to embrace the plastic machines at this level. Yeah. So, so part of that process, they're saying, look. Get on board with us, um, buy one of these machines, get using it within your business, get used to the infrastructure. Because they believe that the natural step to metal, there's not going to be a huge learning curve because the yeah. principles remain the same, they will offset the price of the machine against uh, the metal machine. So let's say we're mm. typically talking sub £105,000. Yeah. You could get eight, ten thousand pounds off that machine by by buying one of these. It's quite unique, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It is. And you keep the machine as well, by the way. So ultimately <laughs> you'll have to. Yeah. They don't just take the money. No, and <laughs> that's it, yeah. Well, thank you for joining us on the show. Oh, and we've got, well, for every guest we have, we can both lean over, um, is Ace Wharf and Chips Mug. What's your yeah. favourite drink? It doesn't have to be tea or coffee. 
Go on. It would be coffee. <laughs> yeah, coffee. And yours? Yeah, it's got to be coffee. Oh, yeah, okay yeah. then. Sorry. Oh, right. <laughs> depending, depending what time of the day it is, surely. Yeah, after five o'clock, it's still coffee. Maybe something a bit stiffer in the evening. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah I like During work hours. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you for watching the show. Do not forget to like, comment and subscribe. If you want to watch any previous episodes, click on the links here. And as we always say, keep those spindles turning.